enough folks on here, uh, just to introduce myself and then introduce some of the folks that are uh, your hosts of this event. My name is Anthony Riggi. I'm a almost 30 year veteran in the high pressure laminate industry. Uh, I am one of the few people in the mid 90s, uh, early 90s actually, that was getting trained on exterior grade compact uh, ventilated facades or rain screen systems. Uh, I'm also a, uh, a millwork expert. So when it comes to doing wall panels, ceiling panels, furniture, gluing things, uh, how to deal with certain situations in interior or exterior millwork, uh, I am a, a valuable resource that I am uh, very happy to share with you uh, that which I've learned in my career. So uh, just know that, you know, Surface Materials, your host is, um, you know, we're all one big happy uh, team that um, that uh, really pays. There's uh, Joe Forch, the sales manager, uh, there uh, also online. So you know we we really want to um, be highly accessible to you guys as you're you're thinking about or dealing with some of your project challenges. Uh, we've got a bunch of of surface materials uh, folks here uh, that are on the the class that are your local representatives. We've got um, uh, Nancy Royer. Uh, she's uh, from the Connecticut market. We've got uh, Teresa Porosky. Uh, she's in uh, Northern Ohio. We've got Vanessa Anderson. She's over in uh, New York and Brooklyn, Long Island. And also we've got Will who is currently in Boston but soon to be moving to New York. Uh, and uh, all these, uh, these fine people are uh, true, true professionals in, in, uh, in their trade. So, um, you know, I, uh, just our, our mode here, our, our mission is to always learn and to always share. Uh, so this is a two-way uh, situation. If you see things, if you know things, and you think it's important to share with the team, uh, please, please feel free to do that. Uh, unless anyone has anything to say, I'm going to get started in the CEU. I think we're good. All right. Well, all right. I'm just. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and, and mute everybody, but if there's some, some important question that you want to add, uh, go ahead and throw it in the chat box. Uh, I really feel like I'm going to answer most of the questions that are going to pop up. Uh, if you just give it a couple slides after that question pops into your head, something tells me it's, it's uh, going to be answered uh, soon. But, uh, but certainly we'll take time at the end of this and we'll review anything that uh, that might still be of, uh, of question. So first I wanna give you a sense of, of who we are as a, as a team. Uh, Lamy Tech is not a new player to the laminate industry. We're, we're one of the top five laminate producers in the world. Uh, we are based in Cartagena, Colombia. Uh, when you get really cold and you wanna go on a factory tour, uh, we're one of the, the better ones, okay? And uh, we're right there, right next to the Great Walled City. Uh, Lamy Tech is um, as comfortable on the interior as we are on the exterior, as comfortable making thin uh, laminates for typical cabinetries and counter surfaces and table surfaces as we are making thick uh, compact, which uh, of course this is the class today. And um, you know, Panel X is our particular brand, our side collection uh, that is specifically engineered for exterior cladding. And uh, also our big house project is unique. We are the first laminate producer in the world that has fully offset our carbon footprint. Uh, we're proud after over a year's worth of work to be uh, 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 publishing our EPD and LCA, which will be a, a full cradle to grave analysis uh, of end carbon offset all the way back from <clears throat> the raw material um, uh, sourcing back to papers and resins through our production phases, then distribution steps to our customers who then convert it into finished products, their transit to their customer so that you know as an EPD and LCA what, what it is to have a finished restroom cubicle or tabletop or, or other things, wall facade and, and so forth. So, so we're really proud to, um, <clears throat> to have that as part of our big house project. And uh, let's, um, let's get going. Okay. So again, a health, safety, welfare, 
uh, one hour credit class. So what's our objectives today? Uh, first things is to understand compact, uh, how we define it, what really, what really separates it from other uh, surfacing materials in, in the industry. And then we're going to look at uh, how we make it and then some of the different uh, technologies and benefits that are specific to uh, compact HPL, okay? And, and I think that, um, uh, you, you know, this is not plywood. This is not uh, solid surfacing. It's its own material and needs to be uh, treated as such both in design and also in, um, uh, in its engineering and, and how we, we utilize this program, this product. Uh, next, and then lastly, we'll just review the environmental aspects of what um, what is this. So there's our factory in Cartagena, uh, literally right next to the port. And so it's very easy for us to move goods um, in, in throughout the world. So here's, uh, here's some of the common applications that uh, you might not have um, been aware of. Some of, some of them you are, uh, you know, with companies like uh, Trespa is one of the big, the big brands out there. Uh, this is now a normal option. You know, uh, in the early 90s, when I was teaching ventilated facade uh, CEUs, it was, are you crazy? You're going to let water into the wall. Well, guess what? If water can find its way in and can't find its way out, it's going to do um, a fair amount of damage. So, so we certainly have had uh, folks become much more accepting and, um, and appreciative, actually, of the um, uh, you know, of, of the ventilated system. Now, uh, another commonly known product is the restroom cubicle. You know, if you're in a stadium, if you're at um, a high traffic uh, hotel, uh, uh, Marriott, Hilton's have standardized their uh, restroom cubicles. Of course, we're calling it solid phenolic in a lot of cases. Uh, I'm calling it compact. I'll get a little bit more into that uh, soon on the verbiage. Uh, outdoor tabletops and indoor tabletops is very common in the European markets and one of the, the fastest growing table solutions or table surface materials uh, that you'll be selecting or, or thinking about uh, as more and more manufacturers embrace this uh, option. And also as we, um, as, uh, as diners, are looking for more and more outdoor dining options. This is the one that surprises most, bowling alleys. Since 1970, almost all of your bowling lanes were, were moving away from uh, plank maple and they were moving towards compact HPL. And uh, I spent a number of years trying to uh, really rock the bowling lane world uh, only to come to realize that these things just don't wear out and there's just not that many bowling lanes going up these days. So, uh, and what has been proven since the 70s is that the head panel where the ball lands has a proven life of over 25 years. Uh, and you can replace just that panel and where the bowler walks and where the ball is rolling down the lane, uh, we're not seeing any end of life of that. So, so we're talking about a 50 year life product plus plus in many cases, depending on its utilization, for example, like if it's an interior wall application, such as in, in this project, Haveriana University in Bogota, which is a complete passive uh, structure, that, um, that first photo on the left in the, in the presentation was the exterior of that building. So this is a hundred year interior wall. Uh, there's nothing to go wrong with this. Even if the sprinklers go off, there's nothing to go wrong with this material. And compact is one of those few materials that is doesn't care what the humidity is or is not. And for those of you who are working on education projects or any sort of you know situation where you're trying to uh, blend interior and exterior spaces, you know humidity controls becomes very very difficult. And I'm seeing that more and more in specifications where uh, the interior uh, millwork must be able to withstand humidities. Uh, that that get into that uncomfortable zone of um, you know of, of over 55 percent and 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 sometimes when it gets up to 80 percent or or more you can have some some real issues with um, with traditional millwork uh, sandwiches. 
So e even here in Florida, I'm down here in Southeast Florida, uh, go anywhere up and down the New York, uh, or I'm sorry, New York, used to live there, uh, the, the uh, Florida Turnpike, it's all the tabletops and the serveries and the waste receptacles, the restroom cubicles, all of them are made with compact. Now, another market that has uh, evolved uh, over the last uh, 15 plus years is the laboratory market, which traditionally was a poured resin, uh, you know, surface for the tops. And, and there was certain, some, some cases, some technical challenges with that because the resistivity wasn't really fully consistent because you'd have some of the resins would be better in one area than another area. Um, and it's also not a structural material. So compact and, and uh, especially with some of the cool technologies, which we'll talk about later, like EBC, electron beam curing, we're able to give the surface extreme chemical resistivity and it's a structural material. So we don't need a real thick, heavy product and we can make the components in the lab like the cabinetries and, and the shelvings and, and so forth as well and have colors beyond that of black, uh, which, which is also a nice feature. Uh, the same, um, you know, the, the technology that we're using in the labs, which is electron beam curing EBC, is the technology we would use when we get to outdoor table surfaces that are going to be subject to full UV situations. So, so really when we get to exterior compact, there's a difference between what is vertical, um, satisfactory as a vertical application, what is satisfactory as a horizontal application. So, so there's, there's tweaks in, in technologies that will counsel you uh, on based on what your overall goals and, and challenges are in your, um, in your project. But in this case, uh, this can be uh, yeah, right here on a, on a shore, seashore, and, and uh, not have any effect from salts have no effect from, uh, from UV degradation and still have a factory warranty on the material for 10 years, which is, which is really quite amazing. I think the traditional outdoor tabletop is like uh, uh, from, is about a one year warranty. Now, uh, Architectural Woodwork Institute is going to define this as a melamine impregnated decorative surface over craft phenolic core sheets, right? So this is kind of how we start to get to that term solid uh, phenolic. And then ISO, uh, uh, or international standards, is going to define it as a self-supporting structural material of two millimeters uh, thickness or, or greater. And, and what is amazing, and I've got a sample here, I don't know if you guys can see me, I'm probably a little, a little blob in the corner here, but, but I'm holding a four millimeter uh, compact sheet and, you know, trying to bend this thing, it's got, it's got some incredible rigidity to it, uh, even at an eighth inch nominal uh, thickness. So there are markets for a four millimeter and believe it or not, even some two millimeter situation as, uh, as wall protection uh, systems. And we'll, we'll see some of that uh, in this class. So interior exterior applications, you know, the one thing that uh, Compact does really well is it's very strong and doesn't need a lot of thickness. So horizontal surfaces like your, your, your um, uh, countertops or even tables will often be anywhere between 10 millimeter to 12 millimeter. That's going to be 3 eighths thickness uh, to half inch nominal. And then when we get to exterior cladding panels, they're going to be predominantly 8 millimeter uh, 5 16 thickness, but rarely do we ever need to go thicker than 10 millimeter, which is uh, 3 8 thickness. So, so uh, what we're not seeing is a lot of 3 quarter inch or 19 millimeter. In fact, more and more of the factories are no longer even offering uh, anything thicker than 3 quarter inch or 19 millimeter, really because there isn't any need for it uh, from a technical perspective. So, can you make a, a very dense material acoustically absorbent? Well, absolutely. It's just a matter of you know, putting it onto a CNC. And, and because the structure of compact is so good, uh, you can mill over 70% of the material out of it and still maintain uh, excellent structural characteristics uh, for, for whatever it is you're gonna do, whether it's gonna be as an acoustical element or, or it's a decorative element. Now, let me go back to that term, you know, solid phenolic, because that, you know, for, 
for those of you like me who've got some gray hairs, I mean, that's traditionally what we understood it to be. But the industry broadly, and it's not just me, it's, it's other manufacturers who are saying, you know, that, that technically is a different material. So solid phenolic is technically more like this. It's uh, what's used in the gas industry or electrical components industry. Uh, why? Because it's incredibly strong, long lasting, it's naturally anti-static. And so if you're worried about sparks and, and things that might uh, create some, some flames, uh, this would this would be the right uh, material choice. In fact, uh, um, you know, as the industry is is evolving and growing, we're not using any phenol in some of these new versions because phenol resin is used in the brown core or in the black core. So the brown is the natural craft in a, a color that you craft paper like that you get in a, a paper bag at a store or or a, a brown uh, paper box. And, uh, and then the black is, is simply a dyeing method. And we would do that actually at our factory. Um, you know, uh, some people outsource it, but, but we do it right there at the factory. And uh, we've gotten really good at making sure that that dye saturation through, through the craft fibers is so good that, um, that no matter where you cut into that edge, you're gonna have a nice rich black edge. And even the brown is quite decorative and nice once you, you, you route it and you uh, give it a little bit of a sanding. So there's no edge banding here, right? And that's one of the, the, the key benefits and key features of why Compact is growing. And part of the reason why Compact in, in Europe became so popular is well, plywood's not, not as, as, a, as available as is in the United States, but also too, you know, as labor rates and as employee costs increased in Europe, uh, in fact, if, in Italy, if you hire somebody, you basically own them. I mean, you you can't you can't just fire anybody for for doing a bad job. So so factories, uh, you know, in a lot of parts of Europe, just got very good at automating. And um, you know, fortunately, we're heading around that same direction. So, uh, but but it, you know, compact is ideal for those types of situations because you could put it on a CNC router and make it into a finished component. Uh, without having a lot of hands-on type, type situations. So the white core, the white core is a white craft, but, but in this case, we have to use only melamine plastic resin uh, and no phenol. And when we get to panels that are over 100 uh, panels or more, we can dye it to whatever color that you're looking for. But generally speaking, it's 70% paper and 30% resin, phenol on this side, melamine plastic only on this side. So the phenolic, uh, you know, goes back into the early 1900s. It was called Bakelite. Uh, and so our very first uh, components, electrical uh, consumer products and things of that sort were uh, really paper cellulose mixed with this phenol resin. And, and it's a thermoset plastic resin, meaning when it's cured to its temperature right around 320 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, then that it cures, it doesn't melt again. So, you know, plastics have two basic categories. You've got a thermoforming uh, plastic, which you can melt and reform over and over again, polyethylene, polypropylene, and then thermal set plastics like melamine and phenol, which when they're cured, there's no other melting and also there's no off-gassing. And generally speaking, thermal set plastics are plastics that are used when longevity and durability are the goal. So. You know, uh, before there were circuit boards, there were, you know, the tubes and the wires and, and those kind of uh, early electrical componentry were using compact panels or uh, even actually back then it was called solid phenolics as, um, as its platform to, to, uh, to hold all of these parts and pieces into place. Uh, then it, later it became a decorative material as well, and that started opening up a whole nother industry uh, of which Formica was one of the, the, um, the innovators. So uh, Westinghouse and General Electric, these were really your first laminate producers. And these were uh, components that were being made um, for, you know, first generation washing machines. But even today, if you go buy table saws or routing tables or uh, ping pong tables, uh, you know, anything where you want flatness, you want uh, longevity, you want durability, you want flexibility in color and texture and, and just different dynamics because you want a bowling ball to have a certain amount of roll and, and flatness. It's like all of these technical requirements, 
Compact has proven itself to be one of those ideal uh, options. So here's the raw uh, material. Uh, here we start with the craft paper. Uh, comes to this in massive rolls. Uh, the United States is by far the largest producer and exporter of this type of, of raw material, um, in large part because our timber industry is just so big. And so the paper is pulling off uh, the off fall uh, from the timber industry. So imagine, you know, if you can't get a two by four or you can't get plywood, uh, you have the limbs of the trees, you've got so much uh, you know, fiber, uh, cellulosic fiber that's in the timber process that can't be used by the timber industry, and that would go to the paper industry. Uh, I mean, that's not entirely, it's entirely the resource we're using, but, it, but it's a large portion of it. Now, the phenol resin is, uh, in, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's a fossil fuel byproduct, you know, uh, some people are yay fossil fuel industry. Some people are boo fossil fuel industry. Uh, right now, you know, we are looking for um, alternatives. Uh, we're looking at lignum as a natural uh, resin. We're not there yet. We're not to a point where uh, these uh, plant resins are able to give us the kind of characteristics that can take this fast growing uh, resource, which <clears throat> very often is treated as a very temporary resource and turn it into a hundred year, potentially lifelong um, finished product. So currently phenol is still our predominant resin that we use. <clears throat> and, you know, th there can be a lot of fears around uh, fossil fuel chemicals. And in certain cases, those fears are very valid, but uh, phenol is one of those ones that's in our daily lives. Um, well, you know, I'm not drinking a fine Scotch whiskey every day, um, <clears throat> but it's there. And it's in an aspirin, and it's in throat spray as a natural antiseptic. So, so obviously, you know, we're consuming these things, and no one has ever raised the red flag and say, "Uh oh, your phenol consumption is, uh, you know, causing horrible things." Now, melamine is the other uh, plastic resin we use on the decorative surfaces, and melamine uh, is an ammonia-based plastic, uh, and it it has excellent clarity as you saw the phenol has that amber tonality to it so so we can't use it in color in cores or or, or things that are other than brown or black <clears throat> so when we want the color uh, to come through melamine is is the predominant choice comes to us as a white powder and then we boil it into a clear plastic resin and then it would cure again around that 320 degrees uh, fahrenheit so uh, there was some bad press back, uh, I guess, about a decade ago when in China, the Chinese were putting melamine in their, their uh, baby milk as a protein enhancer. So melamine is one of those things that's perfectly safe. You know, just probably don't put it in your baby milk. Uh, I would say that would be wise. And so we know we've heard of melamine board um, and, and why is melamine board and compact so different in their, in their technical features? Well, because the melamine treated decorative paper on the melamine board or TFL, uh, as it's often called, is at lower pressure, lower heat. And so it's just likely that that core can absorb some of that moisture. And so traditionally, these types of panels are used as low cost uh, cabinet alternatives. Um, interesting note, you know, even Ikea right now, who is probably the world's largest user of this type of material, um, I wouldn't say probably, I'd say almost definitely, is now evaluating this saying, well, gosh, you know, we're having too much um, impact on the world's landfills. And we need to uh, really rethink this and go with materials that have better longevity and they're, they're really advancing in some reclamation programs. And, you know, it's good to see that. So um, compact, of course, just means the same melamine, but now you have the melamine treated decorative paper, you have the phenol craft, you have the melamine, there's usually a barrier sheet on top of that, it's another layer of melamine, and then you've got high heat, uh, 320 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, high pressure, which is um, around 1200 pounds per square inch of pressure. And then we see melamine in our daily lives in outdoor indoor plates and you know mugs when you go to the diner and these uh, you know I'm sure we've all had experience uh, in seeing how well they can go from the dishwasher to the microwave to the freezer and and um, be all sorts of cool colors and and have great longevity to them. So here's the decorative paper going into its melamine resin bath and this is the science of laminate production. This is where uh, you know we can control the pitch. 
uh, the speed, um, we know the weight of the paper, how much resin saturation we expect to get into this, uh, this paper. And, and this is, um, you know, there's not a lot of willy nilly stuff here. This is very uh, closely, closely monitored and always evaluated to making sure that we're getting the right resin impregnation uh, so that we get the, the right qualities at the end. So now the craft goes through the same resin bath, but with phenol, and you've got this long drying process uh, or, or a tunnel. And then on the back end of that, you end up with uh, now resin treated or resin saturated papers, but either decorative or core craft papers. So making a, a, a thicker laminate is just simply adding more sheets of paper, uh, which is, is weighed. Uh, so that when it goes into the uh, press assembly room, uh, we, we have these teams that are uh, following the order sheet. And, and this is still a very labor intensive process. You know, we employ over 500 people, uh, but, but, you know, large laminate factories, it's normal to see anywhere between five to 700 uh, folks walking around. So, so this is um, still a very human uh, involved process. And then uh, this is a steel press plate. And these steel press plates are the negative of the finish that's going to be pressed into uh, the surface. So you have the craft, you have the decorative paper, and then you build these stacks, which would then go into uh, one of our presses. This is called a multi-daylight press. Um, and you know, part of the reason why you don't see new laminate manufacturers popping up because it's incredibly capital intensive. I would say to put a press online uh, with the machinery necessary and the housing you need, uh, this, I'd say the entry investment is around $15 million. So, so that's why, you know, this is, um, you know, presses, uh, some of these presses are, you know, going on 80, 90, 100 years old and they're well-maintained and and uh, because the, the, the technology here is pretty simple. In this case, you've got these giant cylinders and these, uh, you know, these are 24 diameter inch cylinders and they're able to close down these platens um, down up to about 1200 plus PSI. These pipes are pumping hot water, which we recycle throughout the factory. And that's gonna get that heat up to that 320 Fahrenheit. And, and then the time uh, is about an hour and a half. So what happens happening is now all of those resins that were saturated into those fibers, they start to what's called polycondense. So they flow, they go fluid, fiber to fiber, joining everything together. And then you end up with this just incredibly dense hunk of cellulose and resin. Again, 70% cellulose from paper and 30% um, thermoset uh, resin. So we might start off with say a three quarter inch stack of, of paper and it comes out as a half inch uh, product which would then go through the trimmer. And when it comes out trimmed, uh, you don't, you no longer see those layers of paper. It just looks like a, like a, just almost like a, a salt surfacing at that point. But, but this is something you could never do with a salt surface. And that, by the way, is me standing on a half inch thick compact. And, and it's, um, it's kind of like a diving board in a way, but, but not meant to flex. It's, it's got some flexure. And it, um, it will certainly go, uh, you know, you can go 36 inches unsupported and, and there's, no, there's no simple formula. Uh, we, we really look at every project and we see, okay, what are you looking to do? What kind of weight is it gonna support and so forth? And then we'll help you detail what kind of under supports that you might need for, for cables or counter surfaces and things of that sort. Now, like you would imagine in any laminate collection, you have a fixed color range <clears throat> as we do. But now with the advances in digital print, it really is the sky is the limit. And um, we can sequence those panels and we can allow you to do all sorts of uh, branding or, or you know, celebrate your, your university. And you know, here's our head office in, in Bogota, uh, Colombia. And this is just you know, in one building, you can see the different finishes, the gloss, the mats, the CNC millings. Uh, the digital print. And so it you know, there's a lot of cool capabilities uh, with the same panel. By the way, this is all 5 16 8 millimeter. And that, yes, that is a rear mount mechanically fastened 8 millimeter uh, panel right there, which we do quite a bit. Uh, I, I know some manufacturers have uh, kind of can, said you have to use 10 millimeter or 3 8 for that. 
uh, but we are, have been very successful with, with eight millimeter using that, which goes to show the quality of the, of the product. So, you know, we've been looking at thick surfaces for a lot of years. And the one thing I've learned in, in, in my career is that design trends tend to, they tend to flop. They tend to go about 180 degrees because when we're looking at one thing for too long, we get tired of it and we go almost complete opposite. So, so now if you go to Neocons or you go to some of these furniture shows, you see these razor thin uh, surfaces because it's just so different than what we've been used to. And Compact does that really well. Here, you're looking at a quarter inch thick counter surface. Uh, and what, what I like, I would probably not do it again as six millimeter, I would do it as eight millimeter if you wanna really kind of minimize that thickness. But what's cool is at eight millimeter as a counter surface, not only is it incredibly affordable, incredibly durable, incredibly easy to fabricate, but it looks like that premium porcelains, which are incredibly expensive, incredibly hard to fabricate. And so if you start doing multifamily or rentals and you want to kind of really make it look cool and trendy, uh, this would be something that um, might be of consideration. So the CNC milling, you know, not only opens up the ease of the fabrication of the finished component, but we can also dig into the product and create these little reveals, uh, which can be really cool from a, from a design standpoint. And, you know, the thing about CNC's is, you know, when I first got started, almost nobody had these things. Now, almost everybody has these things. Uh, so, you know, understanding how to mill compact is just a matter of the tool, uh, the rotation speed and the travel speed of the, the router. And, and that, those are easy conversations that we can have for folks that have never fabricated compact. Uh, it's not a long uh, learning curve to really, you know, get into the compact fabrication business. I tell folks, if you can handle hardwood plywood well, you can handle uh, compact well. So here's just you know, uh, taking advantage of that white core with a wood grain outer skin. And, you know, these uh, types of uh, panels are really uh, quite, quite trendy right now and, and separating spaces. Uh, and you can have a lot of fun with these. You know, going back to those, well, what about as an interior panel when you have um, climate challenges because the doors are opening and maybe all the humidity is escaping or maybe you want to keep the doors open and all the humidity is coming in, you know, whatever your climate, you know, challenges are, uh, Compact, just to reiterate, doesn't care what the humidity is or is not, providing you have airflow to all sides of the panel. And that was one of the, the limitations and the reason why Compact took so long to come to North America was because it took us a while to accept ventilated facade. Um, and, you know, just uh, in the interior here, put some rock wool behind there and an acoustician would be able to calculate your open face and your NRC value uh, on this pretty, pretty easily. So whether you're machining door pulls um, or you want to really look at doing a mechanical fastener, here's another shift. You can't use a wood screw in a compact. It's too dense. So the thread diameter, the, the bite on a wood screw is too large and would very, you're either going to break the fastener or you're going to damage the compact. So the smaller the thread in the fastener, the better the bite into it. And so uh, whether they're going to use brass inserts, which is probably the, the, you know, the fanciest way and, and the best way uh, to do your mechanical connections, but a lot of folks are just going uh, tapping right into the compact itself putting their mechanical fastener in there. And uh, I've had great results with this um, for things like tabletops and even cabinetries and all sorts of other things. Now you always wanna be using a non-corrosive fastener, but look at the math here, right? So, so if you have a quarter inch diameter fastener and it, with a half inch bite, you're looking at a 650 pound pull strength per fastener. So, you know, these tabletops where you might've had to use eight fasteners into a plywood substrate, uh, three quarter inch, you would get away with four fasteners into a half inch material. So it's just that strong. It's, um, it's really quite, quite impressive when you, when you do it and you see it. So this is uh, EJ Thomas uh, Hall. It's in, it's, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, I forget the university. <laughs> Kelly's going to kill me because we did this project together years ago. But uh, it, it's, uh, what's cool about this project is- It's in uh, Akron, Ohio. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Appreciate that. So, uh, so this was, uh, gosh, probably five years ago. 
And what's interesting about this project is that uh, the contractor was a friend of the university, done a lot, had the, the trust of the university, never worked with Compact before. The project had two other walls on it that were subjected to um, humidity challenges. So there was two walls prior that failed. Why? Because what university wants to climate control a space that they're not using, right? So, uh, so their contractor, after just a, an hour or so of conversation and some samples that they got to play with, went with simple, basic off-the-shelf Z-clips, which are many different sources to get it from. And then he used an eight millimeter, five sixteenths thick panel. Uh, and, uh, and that's all just basic Z clipped right to the substructure. I mean, it was a very easy install, never had any challenges, any complaints and did an excellent job. Uh, and this is the last interior wall this university will have until this building is, well, you know, they get tired of it and they want to change it to something else. So you've got the decorative surface uh, laminate, the, the normal thickness, uh, thin laminate you can bond to your doors. You got your compact over here. Of course, they match identically because they are the same paper, the same uh, plate finish. And um, this was uh, incredibly cost effective for them as well. I mean, even if the sprinklers go off, this, this wall will be uh, perfectly fine. And we're also able to meet the fire requirements quite easily uh, in this as well. Now, uh, I was holding up the sample here of the four millimeter, right? And this is one of the applications of where we would see four millimeter compact as a wall protection in medical facilities. Uh, so, so this is just kind of gaining some momentum in the, um, in the US and Canada. Uh, this is the norm if you pretty much go, well, anywhere else, uh, China, anywhere in Europe, this is how they treat their walls in, in hospitals. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention uh, yet is that uh, all of our uh, products are antimicrobial as standard. Now, that's not, that's not everybody, um, but, um, but that is- Anthony, Anthony yeah. we do have a question. Yep, I see that. Andrew, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, hey, um, just going back to the, the wall in the university there, um, are there concerns or, or do you need to address thermal expansion? So like if it's sitting in the sunlight or if it's, uh, you know, if, if it gets to be warm in that space, how, okay. how does the, the compact handle expansion and contraction? Great, great question. And, you know, you, you probably remind me that I, I don't talk about this enough in the CEU. Uh, so compact is, is because it's 70% cellulose, expands and contracts with humidity change. Now, you know, humidity and temperature aren't always in alignment, but, you know, I mean, uh, it, it, it really is going to look at what is the mean humidity over about a 48-hour period. Now, the expansion contraction in humidity change um, is really quite small. I mean, it, you're, you're talking in an eight-foot length. It's, it might grow two millimeters, you know, you're, you're in total. So that's, um, you know, what is that? Like a 32nd of, a, 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 no, two millimeter? Yeah, it's like 32nd of an inch. So um, now when it comes to thermal expansion, it, this is not affected by any thermal issues. In fact, that's one of the cool things they, they love it, why they love it for um, exterior cladding uh, is you can go from a really, really hot day to a cold uh, rain and go back to a hot day. And the compact is just really doesn't care about the temperature. It cares about where that humidity is over a 48 hour period. And it's just adjusting. So that's why you have these gaps is to allow for that um, uh, humidity uh, expansion contraction. Did that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, I think that covered it. Thank you. Awesome, great, thank you. So, um, you know, so these types of systems that are being bonded to, um, to gypsum in some cases, in most cases, you know, if you have a demising wall, you, you need to still have gypsum. Uh, but if for some reason one of these panels does get damaged, you can replace one of these panels. That's the beauty about laminate. Ten years from now, you can come put another gray panel on there, even if you ran through your attic stock, and it's going to match. Uh, and you know, add to that the antimicrobial technology, the high impact value, the, the class A fire resistivities that we have, uh, all of the color options that are available to you. It just starts to make a lot of sense. And you know, I, I've seen and how expensive those crash rail programs are 
And, um, and I know that people that do medical design are starting to get a little tired of that and they're looking for something a bit different. So um, let us know if we can help you on that. Uh, now, uh, transport has been another major market that has looked to compact as a wall cladding option. Well, why? Because, you know, they're designing with a 50 year lifespan, you know, in mind and they, you know, have to design surfaces that people can lean up against, people can put their luggage against, people can potentially, uh, you know, try to deface, but, but not, not be easily done. Uh, materials that are fire retardant could handle sprinkler systems going off. Uh, it, it keep going, you know, so, so this is uh, Istanbul airport. I took this picture actually um, about a year ago and, you know, notice the gloss, you know, the, the, it, now it's not going to have the same, you know, flatness as glass, but it's the next best thing. Uh, and it's certainly far more cost effective. And if we start to put carbon uh, into the equation, and that's really starting to happen, right? And in fact, in the UK, uh, for example, or other countries that are really starting to pay attention to the Paris Accord, uh, in, in the UK, if you are not documenting your carbon footprint in the next year, you will not be able to trade in the UK. Uh, so I don't know at what point some of this is gonna start to translate into our economies, um, but certainly it's nice to know that, you know, when you look at materials, you can start to think of, well, yeah, glass is a great material, but it is very carbon intensive uh, to produce. And yes, it's cradle to cradle. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's no perfect uh, solution. So, so as a carbon store, uh, we have a good story. Uh, as renewability, it's a different story and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that at the end. So same project in Istanbul, just uh, as we get into the uh, restroom cubicles or, or other areas that are very hands-on, uh, we've proven that this is that material that can be kicked. It can be really, you know, it's easy to clean graffiti off of. Uh, it's easy to mill. You know, these were just cut on a table saw. Uh, no fancy CNCs here, just literally ripped planks on a table saw in a, in a standard mill shop. Uh, same situation in this case here in these uh, racetrack gas stations, uh, which are big around the Southeast. We did about 50 or 60 of those things. And then uh, this is, again, back to our Haberiana University, which uh, we're really proud of because I think literally we produced almost every material in and outside of this project, uh, except for those metal panels there. And, and what's nice is, I mean, I can drive up to this building, um, which I was at right before COVID. And after almost 10 years of use, the building looks brand new. I mean, it literally looks like it was just uh, put up. And we know it has had no cleaning, uh, no nothing uh, done to it. And it just, uh, it really does hold up to, and this is high altitude. Uh, and you've got a, a roadway right there that produces quite a bit of, of soot uh, from, from uh, you know, the, from the automobile's uh, gas pipe. So uh, this is a passive structure. And, uh, you know, we've got about 120 colors that are standard in our range but then add to that sequence digital print and you really can uh, exercise your, your creative spirit here, right? Or allow your client to um, mix their, their marketing budget in with their construction budget. You know, and, you know that's, that's one way to get more money out of your client is, is tell them uh, you know, to look into their marketing uh, dollars. So you know, projects like this and this Volvo uh, it's amazing how well this material handles on site with circular saws. I mean, now I've seen guys do it with just uh, Diablo 60 tooth carbide blades does, does a great job. You only get about 200 linear feet of cut out of a blade because the stuff's so dense, but you know, doing these sort of miters and milling in the field is much easier than you would imagine. And in certain cases, I recommend it just because certain things are just too difficult to communicate from the site condition to the um, uh, to a shop. So, uh, you know, if you've got a good skilled carpenter, it's amazing what they can do with this stuff. So how do we look at or how do we measure exterior grade versus interior grade? So, so our factory keeps um, these accelerated weather testing machines constantly humming. Uh, so we're constantly checking the papers that we're getting in uh, from our suppliers, uh, the resins, formulations, making sure that 3,500 hours in this machine 
is about an equivalent of 10 years uh, on the exterior of a building. So they'll stick samples in here uh, and then they'll check them every week and, and you know, just, just make sure that we're all on, on uh, understanding that our warranty is valid to the product that's going out of our factory. Now, uh, face fastened is the easiest and cheapest way currently uh, to, to do a ventilated facade. Uh, normally right now you see aluminum substructures and uh, you know, SFS is one of the biggest guys around here. These are non-magnetic stainless fasteners uh, and that proves to do the job in wind loads and you know, these sort of interior applications. There are many systems out there that can do rear mount mechanical fastens or you could just go with a good old fashioned Z-clip like I showed you earlier. And, and to talk a little bit more about ventilated facades, you know, this isn't a, a, a only a, this is a compact class, not a, only a ventilated facade class. So if you want to talk more about it later, we can. But, you know, overall, what we've learned in, in building structures is if we can protect the structural wall of the building with our water protection and our insulation, we give better longevity uh, to the building. We give uh, we prevent that moisture intrusion, whether it's going to be a freeze thaw problem or, or um, a condensation buildup in that wall cavity, which can cause mold, mold issues and so forth. Uh, shoot, you go to an old building here, a 25, 30 year old building here in South Florida, uh, and, and they keep the AC too low and they don't paint the building enough, it, you walk in and it just smells musty. And that's that mold that's developed in the wall cavity, right? So, so uh, this type of methodology means that, okay, this life of the insulation and water barrier is about 40 years. Uh, this exterior cladding is right around 40, 50 years is about as much as you're gonna expect out of it. So then you pull this off and you redecorate your building, right? But you've, you've given uh, the best chance of the building for efficiency uh, and longevity without you know, extreme issues that could cause you to ultimately wanna tear down the building or you know, even here in Florida, where we see guys come in, they tear all the gypsum off, they try to soda blast it uh, to get the mold smell out, only to, to put it back the way it was, uh, and this, the mold smell comes back like six months later. So, so it's, it, this really is um, uh, a, a great method for, uh, you know, getting those, pre, uh, those, those high level efficiencies and, you know, passive house, which is gaining momentum. Um, you know, you know, it, you, of course, anybody can can say, well, there's good things, there's bad things, you know, we need to allow air flows and things go through. But what we do know is protecting our building and adding efficiencies and lessening our need for heating or, or cooling uh, certainly is all a good thing. So let's review those three methods in which you're going to put um, a ventilated facade together. Your face fastened, which is, uh, and there's a lot of these systems out there, okay. Um, in depending on who your installer is, they're going to have their go-to. But I, I can tell you, some of my early jobs that I was doing in the mid '90s and late '90s, guys were just taking two simple L brackets, one to the subwall. Um, they would use grabbers to, to connect them. They'd have it engineered, and and they would use that just do that. Uh, even some of my early projects uh, were using galvanized hat channel. And that was engineered and shoot, uh, I've got one project here in Fort Myers that went through a hurricane that was done 15 years ago. And uh, galvanized hats are also gaining a lot of momentum. We're seeing that uh, overtaking the volume of, of what's being used as aluminum. Then when you use the rear mount uh, mechanical fastening systems, notice you got this extra two channels. You got this extra horizontal channel and that extra clip. So when you go from face fasten to rear mount mechanical fastening, you could be adding another $15 a square foot to your project. Okay. Now this one, the, the, what I call belt and suspender, which is a double stick adhesive tape uh, in combination with a silicone construction adhesive. This is common in Europe. You need to make sure you've got a team that is experienced with that. It just so happens that we have that as part of our, our network. We can help you uh, get to a rear mount, um, or I'm sorry, a, a belt and suspender adhesive system. What this allows us is to go with a thinner material. It allows us to go with galvanized or aluminum, um, and, and now you don't have that visible fastener. And, and, and as far as the wind loading, you know, down in Florida, engineers are still real nervous about this. 
But I, I got to tell you, this connection, when done correctly, is a superior connection um, uh, for, for high wind type situations. So, uh, you know, thermal breaks, I mean, really trying to take full advantage of the ventilated facade opportunity is something I, I really always encourage folks to, to, to do. Um, yes, it's a beautiful decorative panel. It's probably the majority of the projects are still developers just looking for a pretty panel. That's really durable. Certainly it's that, but it doesn't take you that much more money to add the water protection and add the insulation and take full advantage of the system. So back to what's crucial for compact on the exterior is still equally crucial for compact on the interior. So when you have um, cabinets or counters or uh, tabletops or anything, uh, you wanna make sure you have full airflow to the face and the rear of the panel so that as climate conditions are changing in that space, that the expansion contraction can equalize on both sides of the panel. If that is not done, you will lose flatness in the panel. Now, the good news is you can correct it and the panel will go back flat. Uh, one of the things we see a lot in distribution centers when we ship panels from one climate to the next is that the top panel on the pallet will, well, let's say it goes to a, from a moist climate, which of course for us is the case because it's in Cartagena, to a dry climate, um, let's say to the Northeast, that top panel will have a, a tendency to kind of warp a little bit. Uh, why is because the, the, that top of the panel is drying out faster than the bottom. So it's simple. They just take the, that top panel and they flip it upside down and, and everything is fine. Um, so, so just little things like that to be, to be really careful. Now I, um, you know, I like to walk the walk instead of just talk the talk. Uh, so I built my, when I, my wife and I were rebuilding our house a few years ago, we decided to build our, our kitchen. Uh, this is the workstation off the side of the kitchen at a half inch compact. And I worked with a cabinet maker, a friend of mine who, uh, you know, got real creative with shallow cup hinges, which were off the shelf. And uh, we used all, you know, machine screws and, and we, we mitered these corners here. Uh, so that when the drawers closes and mated with the side panel, uh, this this um, V grooved and and miter uh, edge here to 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 really keep that decorative face there, and and you know I've got teenagers, I've got a calico cat. Uh, this is the kitchen you want when you got teenagers and you got a calico uh, fully clogged. It's uh, it's like you can't kill this thing, and it and it is proof that we can have you know a, a premium looking kitchen. That could be an outdoor kitchen, could be a, an industrial kitchen, could be a kitchen in a medical environment, could be a, a kitchen in a lab. Okay, you got to take out the stone if you're going to use it in some of those situations. But everything else here is compact and has a superior resistance to pretty much everything, including Kiwi the cat. So uh, we have more and more, um, you know, partners and manufacturers. This is a company that uh, uh, surface materials can can absolutely uh, help you get to. This is uh, uh, one of our part partner manufacturers. It's got this beautiful outdoor cabinet program. This can be in fully exposed situation with a 10 year uh, lifespan warranty uh, from, from even from us. And so it's, it's can be rained on full UV, the works. Now, you know, here we're looking at premium kitchens, but maybe you're looking for outdoor serveries. Maybe you're looking for um, other uh, kiosks or other case goods and things that you want to build in in your projects, uh, you can see it's, it's something we can do an excellent job of um, and make it look quite premium. Now, the um, decorative surfaces and the technologies are always evolving. Uh, you, you may have seen this type of technology out there. Uh, this is a, they call it super mat or, um, you know, we have our own brand for it, but it's a, it's a, a surface that is very difficult to fingerprint. OK, uh, and why it's because it's it's not being cured with a press plate it's being cured with an electron beam. And that means there's there's no porosity here. So it feels rubbery. Um, it, it literally goes into a giant microwave to, to cure the surface. And and because in this case, we're not using melamine, we're actually using acrylic on the very top surface. Uh, it means that any scratches that you get in this, you can actually wipe out with a melamine sponge. Some companies, you know, you have to repair with heat, with an iron. Uh, ours is, is one that you literally just wipe with a melamine sponge, AKA a Mr. Clean sponge you get at any home center or, or grocery store. Uh, to me, if you want black or you want dark charcoal gray on a horizontal surface, uh, this is like 
the only real good option, in my opinion. Uh, we're seeing more and more of this in corporate centers. Uh, that low reflectivity is just really, really quite gorgeous and uh, pleasant on the eyes. And the, the ability to repair it is uh, quite amazing. And it's very cost affordable too. Um, you know, even in my own kitchen, I, I'm like, you know, I'm going to celebrate the, the thin. So we went with half inch in, in our kitchen um, that's again using that, that white coral melamine. Um, we're, we're very happy with it. And the other thing too is cool is I could take uh, right, right from my stovetop and I could put it uh, onto that, that counter surface. And I've, um, I've had clients really put me to the task on this. So I've, I've put my iron skillet in the oven to 500 degrees with oil in it and put it on compact to see what the end result is. And there's no negative effect. So it does an excellent job uh, handling heat. And again, no rapid thermal expansion, uh, F FYI. If this was a solid surface or quartz, you'd have rapid thermal expansion and you would have a crack for sure, uh, not the case with compact. So not all products are created equal. You know, we're proud of what we have. Just keep an eye on if, if, it's, if, if it's a really low price, it may be too good to be true. And there's reasons for that. You can make uh, the mill worker's life very difficult if there's a high mineral content in there. Uh, also, you want to make sure that you're working with a factory that stands behind their flatness. Uh, if it either comes out of the press right and it's handled properly by the distribution channels or somebody does something wrong, it can happen. Uh, you know, the curing isn't right, the resin wasn't right, something wasn't right, and a panel can get warped. Um, usually that's caught before it leaves our factory or it's caught at the factory of the producer of the tabletop or restroom cubicle so it doesn't end up on the job site. But if it's flat by the time it ends up to the job site and everything is done properly, um, that's a flat panel, it's gonna stay flat. And, and unless there's something about it where it's like they did a full spread glue to a wall, you suffocate the backside of it, then you'll throw it out of flatness. Now it's heavy stuff, but it's not that heavy. It's three and a half pounds a square foot uh, as a half inch material. And, and, you know, you start to get up to that kind of weight when you start talking about three quarter inch MDF. So, you know, that's why I say it's heavy, but it's not that heavy. So just, uh, you know, some folks will accommodate extra hinge in there to deal with that weight uh, if need be. And, and I also, um, you know, restroom cubicles, which, which you even uh, talk to a lot of restroom cubicle manufacturers, this is the material that they, they know is their growth product. Uh, it performs, it's got the colors, it's got the hygiene, uh, it's got the longevity, it meets the price point, they can fabricate it. And now one of the other cool important things uh, is that, you know, we have a, a press which really is built for this industry. Uh, our press, our largest press is a six foot by 16, which is a monster of a sheet. Uh, and normally we would cut that in half and, mark, and, and sell it as six by eights but it's ideal for these European high privacy uh, compartments where you know, you've got four inches or so from the floor uh, so that you've got the ultimate privacy um, restroom compartment with uh, cell phones that's been increasingly uh, uh, you know, in demand. So we can have fun with the digital prints and you, know, you might recognize this as glass hardware, but it's because it is. So uh, if you're looking for a standoff or some sort of part or piece or component to do something kind of that you've got in your mind, uh, I'll often tell folks, well, let's look at the CR Lawrence you know, site, uh, actually just actually down the street from Service Materials right there is, uh, is one of their, their offices. And you can often find that part or piece that's ideal uh, to work um, with compact and I can help you with that because you know they're they're even four millimeter six millimeter eight millimeter they've got all those parts and pieces to accommodate those thicknesses and the two materials have some similarities uh, in the way they um, they they um, can be engineered with with hardware so uh, outdoor tabletops certainly a growing market is probably one of the fastest growing areas for this outside exterior cladding and the milling or the edge of this is whatever that router is. So that router is, is you know, depending on how many passes. Uh, and this is where the experience of the mill worker comes in, you know, having the right tool, the right speed, the right travel time uh, to get a good end result. And when guys really get their machines dialed in, you don't have to polish this up at all. It's just, a, it's amazing. You get a finished product right off the router table. So uh, FSC, a controlled wood for us is standard. Um, 
to get to a higher level of FSE is a little bit more of a challenge. We have to have conversations. Green Guard Gold is easy for us because once this stuff is cured, once it comes out of the press, there's nothing left to off gas. So indoor air quality is super easy. Um, and, and because we're talking about a renewable resource here, faster renewable resource, uh, you know, that's that key thing in sustainability, right? You want to make sure that you're taking materials in a way um, so that nature can replenish themselves, um, you know, uh, much more quickly than you're taking them. And, and we certainly have that in, in this situation. Um, now in the LCA, when we look at the LCA, you know, although we don't have a cradle to cradle, which is, which is really wonderful, you know, I mean, it, it's the vision and the goal for all things is that there's no such thing as waste, right? But in the case of timber products, sometimes that's not always the case. And you know, we just, there's only certain, yes, we're looking at different reclamation programs where we can reskin a compact panel and make it into another finished component. So that's certainly an option. Um, but, but in the end, you know, after it's 50 year or however many year life, what is more realistic is that it's going to go into that dumpster with all the other wood stuff and it's going to go to a waste energy reclamation facility, uh, which is commonplace in all major cities. And, and what we know is that, that this, like, like oak, is a, is a better log in a fire than a pine log uh, because it's so dense. We can get 95% of the energy back out of it that it took to make it in the first place. So, so there's some kind of a nice story there. Now, uh, I, I mentioned this uh, the very first part of, of one of the things that's unique to us, and, and I hope that other manufacturers uh, will follow suit. I expect that they will uh, in coming years, but we're able to offset our carbon footprint, okay? And how do we do that? Well, it's a matter of understanding your manufacturing process and the energy sources that you use to produce those products for us, it's 85% hydroelectric, so it's super easy. So if only 15% of our energy needs to be offset. And then we look at either forestry initiatives or other, um, which is our own initiative, but there are other investments that we can make to do uh, buy carbon credits and do offsets. And, and then of course, you know, what material you use. You know, something like uh, an aluminum is an incredibly carbon intensive product to make from aluminum oxide, um, uh, our bauxite, okay, and 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 it's of course a lot less if you're going to recycle it, but still, even so, it's very carbon intensive, even though it's a cradle to cradle material. So we got to put all these factors into the kind of the ecological kind of decision uh, machine and and make the the best choice of the material based on where we are and what we're doing in the building. So guys, um, that's a uh, oh, 101. I must have done this before. Um, that's our, uh, our CEU. And uh, I wanna thank everyone at Surface Materials for pulling all you guys uh, together. I'm gonna open up the floor for any uh, questions that you guys have. And um, um, you know, I, I love this, uh, these sort of things because it allows us uh, to talk about your projects um, real easily and, and we can help you guys get to the right specification, the right material and make for great projects together. So thank you guys. Anthony, on behalf of Surface Materials, I'd like to thank you for um, hosting this and uh, for all of your support. We really enjoy working with you. You're a great partner and uh, look forward to um, doing some more stuff here in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for the comment, Steve and Dennis. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Well, it was our pleasure. I'll hang out while some folks sign off here in case some people have some last minute questions. Thanks, Todd. Have a great day, John.
Awesome, Trez. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to close this presentation. And again, uh, thanks for joining. Thank you. Take care. Have a good week. You too. You too. Thanks, Anthony. Always a pleasure.